I feel very, very privileged and honored to be invited by Pastor Dennis to speak to you this morning. And uh, English is not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is not either Mandarin or Cantonese. My mother tongue is Fujian. So it's totally different. <laughs> and, uh, but as a matter of fact, you know, I just introduce a little bit of myself so you know me a little bit more. Uh, I've been uh, here in Canada for over 40 years. I'm 41, no, <laughs> more than that. Uh, I've been here 40 years and I go through the university, career, married life, and uh, now I'm a full-time pastor at the uh, Korean Baptist Church. Isn't that funny, right? <laughs> Korean Baptist. Uh, while I was uh, at the uh, seminary, my professor introduced me to the uh, to this uh, Baptist church. As before, I was working with the uh, Central Presbyterian Korean Church as well. I uh, working with a youth group uh, from the teenager to the career uh, people, and they have about 70 people in the church. And later on, uh, God uh, led me to the Baptist church, and also working with the same age group as well. Um, it's kind of funny, in my whole life I've been working with uh, different age groups. Uh, while I was uh, at the university, I was working with the uh, young adults of my age. And then later on, uh, when I was uh, in the career, then I worked with the uh, young adults as well as the, uh, what you call the married uh, couples. Uh, so every Sunday, we just open our home for at least you know, 10 couples. Uh, to come to our house, uh, to have Bible studies and everything. So I grew up with them as well. Then afterwards, I have three children. Uh, probably you know my son, Matthias. Um, he has been being groomed with uh, some of you in the past several years, uh, having uh, soccer, soccer games with you at the back of the church. So Matthias, some of you may know. And then uh, I was called by God to, uh, to the full-time ministry. But that has been delayed for 38 years. 38 years is not uh, too long, it's not too short. And as a matter of fact, that is God's guidance. Uh, several times I turned down God's uh, invitation. It's only invitation that God asks you to be the full-time servant for him. But as a matter of fact, you always say, no, no, it's not me, someone else. Yeah, over there, Jeff. <laughs> or Winnie, it's not me. Um, so 38 years I've been deter and deferred. Uh, finally, one day when I was sitting in my office, at that time I had my own company, very, very successful, uh, making a lot of money, but yet that time I say, God, give me the last chance. I will do that. So May the 1st, I quit everything, and then I went into the seminary. Uh, I was with uh, Pastor Felix of the Cantonese congregation for two years in the seminary. That's why we know very uh, much of each other. And then since last October, I accept the uh, invitation to come over here to teach the Cantonese uh, adult Sunday school. So from that time on, I have been associated with your church. And I can see your church is, is, is a kind of vibrant church. Yesterday, I came and celebrated the VBS, uh, uh, what you call the uh, showtime. Uh, with so many kids on the platform, I was so thrilled. And those 60 to 70, or even up to 100 some, those will be our future leaders of the church. And uh, today I was overwhelmed with you, especially with your worship team, uh, Jeff and Winnie, to listen to songs. And uh, let us bow our heads for this moment and pray to God so God's word will become upon us as a blessing from heaven. While I'm speaking, I appreciate if you can pray along with me so God's word will be delivered without any hindrance. Uh, probably um, from my speaking, you can, you can detect some of my, uh, what you call the uh, Chinese uh, uh, song or tune, say, or even the uh, sentence pattern is quite different from yours. So I pray that God will break this kind of barrier and his word will be the first. Today I'm talking about the Lord is my shepherd. Thank you very much uh, for setting up the uh, PowerPoint for us. And uh, in the whole passage, I'm taking from uh, HCSB, uh, uh, 
uh, that is the uh, version you've been using all the time. Uh, this is very, very good uh, version and translation as well. It's better than the NIV and it's very close to NASB. It's really close to the original language. So can we have it? Okay. In this psalm, you can have two parts. The first part is verse 1 to 3. As you can see here, they use the pronoun he, he, and then the author will use it, me, me. Sometimes you, if you know a, a person from a distance or the relationship is not that close, you're always using he, he, he. Or you have something bad saying about that guy, you always say he, right? And that is the way the psalm is presenting. The verse 1 to 3 is a very distant uh, relationship. He and me. And now we look at the 4 and 6. Now, he changed the tone. The he becomes you. Very, very intimate relationship. Very, very close relationship. You, 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 and me. So as we can see, this psalm is very well known to everybody. And it has been you know, uh, putting as a plaque, and uh, maybe you have it at your home as well. And uh, it is so well known that so many times people recite or pray this prayer or this psalm as a kind of asking for rescue in the time of difficulties or maybe during the war time. And uh, this is uh, uh, the way that uh, from most of the movies, uh, you can see either a priest or preacher standing by the graveside and then recite this psalm. So give us a kind of opinion, saying that, yeah, this psalm may be a kind of, of a doom and gloom and uh, no hope at all. But to us, as the uh, uh, people of God, it is very, very promising. And that's why I'd like to share with you this morning from several uh, perspectives. And as we are growing up, we know that we need someone, we need someone whom we can cast our worries with, hoping that that someone will listen to our plea and give us a hand, lifting us out of the problems that we are facing. And that's why we always say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or saying that your I shall not lack of anything. And this psalm is to really speak about the relationship, as I say, between this someone and then later on turn into a very, very intimate relationship. The Lord, L O L O D. Would you be surprised to see that you know the uh, Old Testament, the Lord, L O L O D, in the Old Testament is quite different from the New Testament. This in the Old Testament, the Lord is all capitalized. It's a very, very what you call particular uh, prone, uh, 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 name for God. And sometimes we take it for, for lightly, saying the Lord in the Old Testament will be the same as the New Testament. So we just treat it for, for lightly. But as a matter of fact, as, uh, as the spelling coming out, L-O-R-T, when they translate um, the Hebrew term, God into English term. That is the only way they can find out is using all capitalized L O R D. In Hebrew language, Hebrew language, when they don't have the uh, what you call the uh, the vowel sound added to their letters, their letters are consonants. And four letters representing the name of God of theirs. Y H W E. And later on in the 16th or 17th century, they add the vowels and then say Yahweh, Yahweh. In the uh, King James or the, uh, uh, the older um, uh, translations, they translate into Jehovah. Because in uh, Hebrew, the Y sounds like J in English. So Yahweh, in somehow, when they translate it uh, by the song, it sounds like Jehovah. That's why in the uh, King James you see the Jehovah all over the Old Testament. But now come to 1973 when the NIV translation com uh, committees come to this term and say, no, no, no. Jehovah never, never represents what is the full meaning of uh, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. 
So from that time on, they come to a conclusion. Okay, now we're going to use L O R D, all capitalized, all capitalized. What does that mean then? Yahweh in Hebrew is very, very figurative. If you know the Chinese uh, words, you know all Chinese are very, very uh, characteristic in their own meaning. In their own meaning. So same thing with the Hebrew. Y H W H. The H is like a nail, like a nail in writing, in the writing. And then W is like a door, a door. So in other words, Yahweh, the Y is like a parcel. In other words, telling that this term is meaning a lot to us. In the Old Testament, Yahweh means salvation. In the New Testament, Yahweh that is similar to Lord Jesus Christ. The two nails representing the nails nailing him onto the cross, and the door is saying that it is only one door we can enter into his kingdom. And therefore, Jesus say, not through any kind of means, but through me, you can go to see my Father, and I am the only one. And that's why the Lord means a lot to us. When we look into this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Let us concentrate on the name Lord. The name Lord. Therefore, in the Hebrew, in the Israelite history, the Lord means God. This God is very, very special to them, and this Lord uh, give. Gives them a lot of promises from their forefather Abraham down to now. Every promise has been delivered, and that's why in Exodus chapter three, he says, you know, uh, when Moses said, "Yeah, Lord, you're going to send me to see the uh, Israelites, your people, but how can I introduce you?" Just like you know, I've been introduced to you by Bernard or whoever. My name is all over Bernie, uh, Bernard, or whatever. It's so different, different kind of introductions. But at that time, God say, "My name is Yahweh. My name is Yahweh." Translated you into English, I am who I am. Does it make sense? No, not at all. Or even translated to, "I am that I am." Even worse, but as you can see, "am" the continuous tense in English. It means forever. We just sang the uh, uh, sang the uh, song, "His everlasting God," and that's what it means. I am the beginning. I am the end, and that's what the Lord means. The Yahweh, no beginning and no ends, and He's the one making this heaven and earth. And that's why Yahweh is very, very meaningful to the Israelites. Whenever they say, "Hey, that's the one," because without the vows and because of their fervent uh, uh, for God, they never speak the name of God. Here in the Western world, we say your names and without any titles, and even with your boss, you never say sir or whatever. But in my、uh, my old、uh, days, we all say Mister So and So or Mrs. So and So. But here we always use our first name, right? For the Israelites, they honor God so much. They never, never speak the name aloud, and that's why, hey, that one, that one. Whenever they talk about that one, that means Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord. So it is very, very meaningful to the. Uh, to the Israelites. Secondly, when we say the Lord is my shepherd, shepherd is totally different ideas from our、uh, perceptions of cowboy, right? Shepherd and cowboy never mix. What does that mean by shepherd? In the old times, shepherd is the one leading the flock of sheep to somewhere else, and likewise. The shepherd representing leaders. Leaders in the uh, uh, prophets of the Old Testament, always representing the rulers, the kings, as the shepherd. As the shepherd. That's why God always challenged the leaders and the rulers, saying that, "Hey, you're supposed to be a good shepherd. Why you kill and slaughter the fat one?" And never take care of the weak one. You are the shepherd. 
So the meaning of shepherd is the ruler, is the one ruling the people. And then in the uh, theological terms, shepherd representing God himself. In the uh, New Testament, in John 10, 7 to 10, it says, you know, that is the shepherd giving life. Jesus said again, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. And who came, all be, came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, only one, the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will come in and uh, go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. You see, that is shepherd. Providing the protection, providing the nourishment of everyday life. And also, here it says the protection. John 10, following. I am the good shepherd. I, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The high man, since he is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, lifts them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a high man and does not care about the sheep. As you can see, the meaning of shepherd is totally different from we are seeing. From we are seeing. Last of all, this shepherd provides the salvation. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice, and then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Is it clear enough? The Lord is my shepherd. It's a very close relationship. And therefore today, I'd like to speak with you with the acronyms of L-O-R-D. Number one, L means leadership. O, ownership. R, restoration. And then last of all, D is our destiny. All these four words or the four letters have been uh, portrayed in this psalm. So we go on from there. What do you mean by leadership? Leadership. In the verse uh, 2 and 3, he says, you know, uh, he leads me to the quiet stream and green pasture. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. So in other words, leadership, you need planning. You know, everything have, have to have a plan. You cannot just, you know, blindfold yourself and go, okay, let us have a picnic. Okay, after service, let us go. Maybe we go to McDonald's, maybe go to Wendy's, maybe to Harvey's for, for, for kind of a light lunch. And then, okay, where would you like to go? Sandy Beach? Wolverman? No, no, no. Let us go to Elk Island. You see, without planning, everything won't come into place. And that's why leadership needs the planning, the planning. Why I say that planning? Because in the old times, before the shepherd leads his flock to the green pastures, he has to plan where to go. Why? Because the sheep cannot travel fairly long. They can be weary, they can be tired, and they can be killed with that kind of exhortation. Not only the place he has to be determined, but also the time for the traveling has to be calculated. The sheep is so fragile, you never know about sheep. One time I was working with a farm, and they say the sheep is the funniest animal you have. They can be scared so easily. When you walk by, try to pet them, they run away. Or even you try to feed them, they never do it. But on their own, they will eat everything. Sometimes when you slaughter or kill a sheep, open uh, the stomach, you find everything in the sheep. Maybe not a bows or even a, a barbed wire. Wow, weird, right? The sheep eat everything. <laughs> Funny, not just like a pig. So next time when you say, you know, you eat like a pig, maybe he eat like a sheep. Everything you eat. <laughs> you just pull it into your stomach and that is the, the sheep. If you understand that, then you are why uh, uh, God always leads us to the green pastures. 
green pastures. So, as you can see, green pastures, it means the quality of the grass, the nutrition value. Probably when you go to Safeway or go to superstores, you always read your nutritional labels, right? Hey, that is our daily intake, how much percent. If I take this package, they're representing 10% already, so I better watch out. And that is how uh, uh, what you call the medical uh, uh, people would like to educate uh, our laymen how to eat so we can have a better uh, body to live and without any disease or even we can have our life longer. So the uh, nutritional value, the location of pasture are uh, all have to figure out first. You cannot just say, hey, okay, let us go. It is my job, eight to five. Let us go then. Okay, I'll be dropped by at the Tim Horton, pick up the coffee. Oh no, this morning I'd like to have a Starbucks. Forget the Tim Horton. No, everything has to be planned. If the grass is too short, uh, too short uh, they will hurt the mouth of the sheep. If it is too long, the sheep cannot bite into it. Short grass will not have good value, while the long ones will not have the nutritional value. One time I was working with the lab doing the agriculture uh, uh, analysis. At the end of the summer, in the early of the uh, fall, they always bring in the haze, uh, which is stock up for the uh, coming uh, winter for cattle, uh, even for sheep, or for everything. So when they bring in the hay, you can see that all the green ones always have the best value. They always uh, test the value in terms of protein, calcium, uh, nitrogen, all those uh, full nine yard uh, analysis. But when you see some kind of a discolored hay, you know uh -uh, it's no good at all. And then you can tell from the touching of the hay. Likewise, God always brings us to the green pastures. It's not discolorized. Probably we don't like discolorized ham. We don't like, you know, discolorized meat. We know there must be something wrong with it. And that's why people add a lot of coloring to the meat to fortify it, uh, to uh, make it look like more value or more flesh. And that's the problem we have to know, the green pastures. God always provides the best for us. And that's why every time when we have the meal, we give thanks to God. Because everything laid on the table has come from Him. It's come from Him. Secondly, when we're talking about green pastures, always come to the stream. The stream. I think we'll be very excited uh, when we are living in the city. When you go to Athabasca, uh, uh, to the Jasper National Park, go to the Athabasca Fall. Wow! The fall coming down is so majestic. And I was there about uh, two, two months ago. It's been uh, uh, a long time before I paid the uh, visit again. Oh, it opened my eyes again. Wow, magnificent. The water rushing down, you know, from that kind of uh, height to create the sound, create the volume of the water. It's so marvelous. But yet, it's not fit for the sheep. Because sheep is a scary animal. They cannot go to any kind of water and then drink from it. Cattle can go to the river flowing very fast. Or even they can wet uh, across the river. But for the sheep, they're scared of it. Even the sound of the water flowing is louder than whatever they uh, have heard before. They just walk away. They never take a drink. They never take a drink. And that's why in the Old Testament, they always say they draw the water from the well and drink the sheep. So here, stream is better, it's flowing freely, and it's not uh, contained in one uh, lo uh, location. Why? We need a quiet stream, and that's why. That's why. The quiet stream won't keep the sheep away from the water, and it has to be very slow moving. Wow, God is so marvelous. Green pastures, green adjective. Quiet stream, quiet is the adjective. God provides everything. So as you can see, imaginative 
uh, picture. So in other words, you know, God's planning every day leading out the flock of a sheep to a green pasture to acquire water. He has to know geography. There's no GPS. Nobody will tell you where you can find the stream. At least you have to Google with the address, then you can have the map, right? But here, no. In the desert, in the changing environment, how can you lead the sheep? So his plan is better than ours. Our school, our career, our marriage, our family, and even our life, our life. As some, even they would say, even before I spend one day, God has planned for me already. Do we really rely on His plan for our life? Let Him have the control of everything. Then let's surrender all and acknowledge Him. He is Lord and He is the Shepherd. Isaiah 65, verse 2. I spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the wrong path, following their own thoughts. Ezekiel 11, 20. So they may follow me and follow my uh, statutes, keep my ordinance and practice them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. And that's the relationship God is waiting for us. Even though we walk away, we may be, you know, a one-day Christian, or maybe we call it Sunday Christian, and yet six days we have our own uh, desires. We have our own plan. We never let God touch our daily life until Sunday. Okay, wow, well, I'll come 9.30. Okay, I'll give God one hour, and that's it, no more. But let God be your shepherd. Let God guide you every day, every day. Secondly, in the Middle East, shepherd is different from the Western cowboys, as I told you before. The Westerners are on the horseback and chasing the herds of cows or horses from the back. So they are not leading. They are just following the uh, animals. From time to time, they have to run off the wandering away cattle with the help of the shepherd dogs. In the Middle East, shepherd is different. He is on foot, never ride on the back of a horse, or never have the quad. Nowadays, a cowboy has the quad, right? Easier. And the way that he goes with the frog is walking in front of the animals. He leads them to the destination and he will not allow the flock to be misled. Misled. Isn't that wonderful? God afraid us to go astray. Listen to something else and never follow the word of God. And that's the way God said, hey, this is the one. You better read it. You better follow it. Otherwise, we'll, you'll go somewhere else. Sometimes we Christians never think your know, Bible is so treasured, to, uh, uh, trustworthy. And we say, yeah, those are the old timers. They have been almost about, you know, so many centuries away. But yet, up to now, Bible is the inspired word of God. And we have to know that. And that's why whenever God says, we listen. And that's the way we telling ourselves we are following God. God. So, the use of the uh, rod and staff is to get the sheep back to the group. The sheep is like us, like our three years old or two years old. They always like to touch things, like to wandering away. They like to survey their surroundings. But the rod is for the protection. And the staff with the hook at the end will get the sheep back. Hey, come on you, come back. You know, it's a tender touch. Not worth the uh, stake, you know, chasing them. No, it's a staff with a, uh, a round off thing. So therefore, it says, you know, in Psalm 63, 8, I follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. So his almighty power is all over us. And that's why we have to really careful about it. So that's leadership. We have to follow them. We have to follow God. Secondly, we're talking about ownership. Ownership. Ownership means mastery. 
we never ever like the term slave, right? When your boss say, "Hey, do this," you always say, "Slave driver." <laughs> Isn't that true? You always chase you to to do me the things that I don't like. But in the Bible, when you're talking about the ownership, it's talking about the master and the slave. And that's why in the translation of the Bible, whenever we come to the term slave in Hebrew or or or, or, or Greek, we always translate into servant. A lighter degree of our duty. Slave is you no know, whatever the master tells you, you have to do it. And even in the parables,、uh, Jesus say, "Hey, when ever at the end of the day you are very exhausted because you're working like a slave, and then you have to come home and prepare the meals for your master. You have to serve them, and you thought, 'Hey, that's the end of it, right?'" No, he said. You know, you have to humbly and ask. Hey, is there anything else, master? When the master say, "Go ahead and relax yourself, have the meal," then you can go. Otherwise, you have to stand by his table until he's satisfied, and that's the meaning of slave. Later on, we translate this word into servant. That means, you know, we are owned. Why? Slave have been traded off or been brought off from the slave market with a price, with a price. Ownership doesn't mean that you know、uh, you just give ten thousand dollars for my car or even you say several weeks ago I saw a Lombardi. It's so nice in my neighbor there is a blue Lamborghini. Wow, so beautiful! I love to have it, but I don't have the money. So you see, ownership. You like to own it, and even nowadays you have your own laptop, right? You have your own iPhone. Why you say own? That means you possess it. Same thing. Jesus say, "I pay a price for you. I shed my blood for your life. I pay a price for you, and that's why you are no longer belong to yourself, but you belongs to me. You under the ownership of God." Christians, brothers and sisters, don't take don't take your position too lightly. God owns you. God owns you. Wow! You say, yeah. God must be a slave driving. Ask me to pray. Ask me to read the Bible. Ask me to witness. No way. I like to go my way. Yes, you can. But God say, hey, my plan is better than yours. Just like in Isaiah, people just walk away from God because they're frustrated with God. And yet God say, "Hey, my way is better than your way. My highway is better than yours." In the、uh, translation nowadays, so that's the ownership. Now come to the R, restoration. Restoration is talking about refreshing, renew, regained, or even here is talking about charging up. Have you ever used a rechargeable battery? You used right. If you are green, <laughs> that means you. If you are environmental, you are using the、uh, rechargeable batteries. When battery power went down, you always charge it up, and that's what they call restoration. Restore to the initial state, initial state, and that's why he says, you know, when I go through the darkest valley, you are with me. Your rod, your staff, comfort me. So restoration is comfort. Doesn't mean that you're know, chasing you or, or, or get you back. No, it's restoring with a tender love and tender touch. Once we were die,、uh, dead in sin, God has chosen His Son Jesus to die on our behalf, that we can renew our relationship with God. And that's very, very important. Last of all, let us go to the destiny. Destiny, destiny. Destiny. That means you know you are dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is the beginning of everything. Everything is caused to exist before because of His glory, and nothing else because of glory. And that's why we always sing the song. We praise Your glory. Sometimes we never understand why we have to praise His glory. Yet Yahweh is the one deserve whatever it is. 
And here it says, you know, we are in Hebrew, we are pilgrimage in this world, in this world, uh, in this world. And sometimes, and someday, we're going to pass away. Then what? What is your hope after that? I've gone to several funerals, and I can see those with a hope because they're Christians. They died with a smile. They know where they're going. Even two days before their death, they always told me that you know I can see heaven is open for me, and that's my eternal home. I'm not scared of death. I'm happy to go there. Don't cry for me. If you like to have the funeral, just have it as a farewell party. One day, I'm going to welcome you in heaven. You're coming to you, and that's the hope, and that's our destiny. Our pilgrimage will be finished on this earth, and yet our future, our hope, is. In God Himself, and that's why David say, "I like to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever, and never else, and nowhere else, and nothing can be exchanged for this." So, as we come to a conclusion, the Lord is my shepherd. Is present tense all the time, present continuous. Let us get this picture right. The Lord and no one else, that is the Yahweh, the everlasting God, will be my shepherd. He has the best. Uh, be, uh, the, uh, he will have the best plan for every one of us. Don't wandering away. He's a good shepherd. He'll get us in. Commit your life to him, because say he is the only door that we can go to him. Let us renew the relationship with him. Okay.